So we were just looking at a very first example um, how to use the neighbors function in uh, a graph script procedure. Um, looking at um, some other examples um, which are um, essential building blocks of um, graph procedures, um, we are looking at the shortest path function. So in a very similar way, um, we are creating um, some, some example data. Uh, we are creating uh, the workspace that we work with. And in a similar way as before, we are creating a database procedure using the graph language, which does have some input parameters and some output parameters. As we do want to call out to the shortest path, or to be exact, shortest path one to one. So we are looking for a single shortest path from a vertex to uh, um, another vertex. Um, we uh, do see the input parameter start vertex, end vertex, and again the direction, which controls um, the edges and how they can be traversed. And the output parameters, uh, we will see that we are returning the length of the path, which is the hop distance. We will return on the weight of the path, and of course, we, uh, in case we use a cost attribute like like distance and the like, and we will return a table with the vertices and edges that make up that path. Um, looking at um, a very simple example here, this is um, the basic call where we're using um, the shortest path function, which again operates on a given graph, which we instantiated by referring to the graph workspace name. Um, we are looking for a shortest path from start to end using a direction parameter, which by default um, defaults to outgoing direction. So um, if I create that procedure, and give it a call by looking for a shortest path from vertex number one to vertex number five, you'll see um, the results as the following. So um, this is a graph that we just made. And uh, we uh, queried for a shortest path from one to five. So what the system derived is essentially um, the nodes one, two, five, one, two, five, so that path in the middle. These are the edges that need to be traversed, so the edges that make up the path. And the final output parameter is, let's say, the hop distance length. So we need to take two hops to come from one to five. So now that was the plain vanilla shortest path um, using, using hop distance. Um, so there are a couple of more advanced versions. And the next one is to calculate the shortest path giving um, a weight function or um, weight column. So as we've seen in the picture already, I've put some weights onto the edges, which you can interpret as time or distance or any other type of cost. So now in our case, um, we are essentially looking for a shortest path, not by hop distance, but by evaluating that uh, weight measure. So if I just override that procedure and call um, this procedure again, we will find that we, now, okay, in this case, um, find a different path. So by looking at the weights here, you'll find that the path from node one over three to five is the shortest because um, the weight sums up to 0.2 and all other possible paths are more costly. Now there is even uh, a little more that you can do uh, when you're looking at um, a weighted cost or cost-based shortest path. So one example here is that we are using that, that edge lambda essentially here to define um, a stop condition. So in this case, you can say, okay, I'm only interested in traversing edges where the weight is greater than 0.2. If the weight is less than 0.2, we'll not follow the path. We will end traverse. We'll not traverse that edge. So this is an easy way how to define stop conditions. So again, I'm deploying that procedure and give it a call. Now looking at the result, now we have found the shortest path one, two, five. This is because the shortest path that we just got in the previous call 
here the edge weight is less than 0.2 so this is not a valid path but this is the shortest path if we're looking at edge weights of um, greater than or equal to 0.2 and uh, last but not least um, I will uh, show you how to do some even more advanced processing. So um, again, I'm calling out to my shortest path function, but now in that edge lambda, I also access the current path weight. So um, if I'm evaluating the path, if I'm finding the path, of course, uh, the partial path already has a weight, a sum of weight, a cost assigned to it. And I can access that information and do something meaningful with it. So in my example, I'm just saying, okay, only traverse edges where the next weight of the edge is larger than that uh, partial sum that I already have up until that um, step in the path. Otherwise, end the traversal. So this is a way how you could evaluate validity of edges while you're traversing, for example, a temporal path. So again, I'm looking into that example, invoking the same query. But now we see we end up with a path going one, four, five. And again, um, this is that path, one, four, five, because um, it uh, satisfies the constraint that um, the, the next edge, 0.4, uh, has to have a weight which is greater than the partial sum up until here, which is 0.2. In that path, it is not true. We have a partial sum of 0.3, and the next edge is 0.2, so it doesn't satisfy that um, uh, that condition. So shortest path, very basic, very powerful um, uh, built-in function, which is exposed via graph script. Um, there are two other variants of um, the shortest path algorithm, and the, um, one of it is uh, shortest path one to all, which looks a little bit similar. Um, again, you're starting uh, with referring to a graph workspace. We do have um, a start vertex, uh, which is instantiated, and now we're calling out to the shortest path one to all. So we we are evaluating the path from that one start vertex to all other vertices in that graph. And uh, what that returned, uh, returns essentially is, is, is again, um, a graph in this case. So it's not a, not a, not a um, single path, but let's say a, a set of paths, so to say. And um, if we're looking at that, um, that output in this case, how you can leverage um, this example, as um, you will find um, things like, um, yeah, in this case, we are starting with a vertex with the ID 1. And of course, the path has length 0 from 1 to 1 because we're already there. And then for each other node in the graph, it returns the minimum path weight to get from 1 to that node. Another example, very quickly, is the top k shortest path. Um, so uh, it does not return a single path, but it returns a set of paths. Um, so in our case, we are returning um, a container data type of sequence. So it's a set of paths, so to say. We're calling out the k shortest path. Again, we are running on a specific graph. We do have a start and end vertex. And here we have the parameter of k, which controls the number of paths being returned um, from that function. Um, there is a specific way to um, project the result list because we do have a multiple path, which might be overlapping, so to say. And um, if I run that procedure, you will see that the result in this case, um, I'm finding one path, which does have the ID one, and it um, does have the length two. There is a second path here and a third path here, which essentially just reflects the different ways to come from one to five, either via here or via here or via that node number four. These are essentially the, um, the top, top three paths in my graph. Um, then, uh, also a very important building block um, for graph procedures is breadth-first um, search traversal. So you're starting at a node or a set of nodes, 
and you're traversing a graph um, by uh, um, hop level, so to say. Um, if we are looking at this specific example, um, again, we uh, are creating a, a procedure using the graph language. In this case, we are handing in a start node and we are saying as a stop condition, um, we provide the maximum a uh, number of hops that that breadth first search traversal should should take and what we are outputting is a set of vertices and a set of edges uh, which um, are decorated by additional attributes so what we are doing here we are instantiating a graph then we are adding two temporary attributes one temporary attribute to the vertex and another one to the edges in order in this case to store the distance or so the number of hops it takes to get from the start node to a specific vertex or edge um, the traversal statement um, just take uh, a direction parameter just like the shortest path it operates on a graph, it starts with a start node or a set of start nodes, and now we do have very um, a powerful hook mechanism. So we can hook into the visit of each vertex. So we're starting with a start node, and whenever we visit a vertex, we um, can call out some custom code, so to say. And what we are doing in this case, we are just storing the a number of hops, the distance in that temporary attribute that I just created, that distance attribute here. And in addition, we're saying, okay, if the distance has exceeded a maximum number, which is an input parameter of the procedure, we are ending the traverse, the traversal. So this is basically what it, what this procedure does. It um, traverses the graph in a breadth-first search can do something while visiting a vertex or visiting an edge. And uh, in our case, when we uh, call out uh, to that procedure and we are starting with node number one and we're saying, okay, we want to go maximum a thousand hops, then we are seeing that with a distance of zero, the node reaches itself. There are two nodes, number two and number three, which have a hop distance of one, and there's, and there's four and five. And again, if you're looking at that example, you can get to two and three within uh, one hop. Four is two hops away, and five is three hops away. Now, um, besides breadth-first search traversal, there is also the notion of depth-first search traversal, which goes to um, a node and then follows uh, the next edge to the next node um, until you read a, uh, reach a leaf node, and then you're going back to the last node, which has unvisited edges, so to say. It follows the, the same idea. So just to show you the call, um, the statement is traverse DFS. Again, you're operating on a graph, you're starting with the start node, and you have these um, um, visit hooks. You can hook into the visit of the vertex, and what is specific for that first search traversal, you can hook into the exit event. So when the vertex is fully processed, so all outgoing edges are visited, then you can hook into that event and do something with that vertex, do something specific. Now, um, these are the, the core atomic building blocks or the, the built-in algorithms that the graph script programming language provides. So it's neighbors, it's shortest path and variants, and it's, it's um, these traversal statements. Now, um, obviously, uh, they are quite useful, but um, what um, you might end up doing is essentially creating custom algorithms where you use these built-in uh, uh, building blocks, so to say. And one example here is um, uh, for calculating the, the, a centrality measure, the closeness centrality, so to say. Um, it's standard algorithm, but we don't have an out-of-the-box implementation. But it's a standard algorithm, and you can implement it using the graph language. So again, let's go into um, that example here. I'm um, creating some sample data. 
Uh, so now uh, I'm, I'm creating a procedure which implements closeness centrality. And in here, what you see is I'm using a BFS traversal in order to calculate a set of um, measures. Well, I'm simply saying, okay, starting from a start node, I'm summing up the number of nodes which I can visit from the start node. And I'm summing up the um, distances to each that uh, uh, these nodes. And then in the final step, after doing that breadth first search traversal, I'm doing some calculations, standard calculations, which are described in, in the literature to, to derive or calculate certain standard centrality measures. And um, the specific thing here is, or which I want to point out is that um, this function, as you just see it, takes one start node into account. So it evaluates the closeness, centrality, and variance um, uh, for the node with ID 1. So, um, uh, but of course, usually you want to calculate the closeness centrality for all the nodes in your graph. And um, so the reason why I took that example is um, to point out a nice way to do parallelization in HANA. And uh, one way to do it is um, to encapsulate um, my procedure in a function and then use the map merge operator in SQL script. So again, this is nothing graph specific. It's a parallelization mechanism in SQL script, which you can leverage on top of a graph specific procedure. So it essentially takes, uh, in my case, a set of nodes, instead of set of start nodes, and for each node calls my graph script procedure via that function. And it does it in a parallelized way and simply returns um, a union result, so to say. So by using that map merge operator, I can call out to the function and it calculates me um, the centrality measures for all the nodes in um, my graph. And so uh, in this case, if we're looking at the graph uh, underneath that example, you see that there are nodes um, 0, 4, and 6, which are kind of more central uh, to the graph, whereas node 1, 2, 3, and node 5 is, is more to the fringe or to the to the edge of the graph. If you're looking at the, at the result here, for example, the normalized closeness centrality, you'll find that the node with the IDs uh, 0, 4, or 6 have a, have a higher closeness centrality. So this is one example in how you can write um, standard or, or custom custom algorithms or standard algorithms using the graph script query language. Now, um, in practice, what we do see is more advanced or a, a little bit specific. So in order to, to give you some ideas about that, one use case that, that we see quite often is in the utilities industry. So think about it electricity grid or, or gas pipelines. And um, one standard task here is to find subnetworks. For example, find all households, all nodes in an electricity grid, which are in a common subnet, which are uh, under the same transformer, uh, so to say. So in these scenarios, um, quite often the data source is, is an ERP system. So you have asset management information where you essentially have the assets and, and the cables, um, which are modeled in, in form of vertices. And you have a connection from, for example, a switch to a cable. And um, that connection is essentially the edges of your graph. And what you're doing for that is, is for example, to, to, uh, to do some maintenance planning. You could say, OK, if I'm, if I'm switching a specific switch or if I'm taking a transformer offline for repair, which subnet is affected by that? And or one approach to do that is, is to use the neighborhood function, which I showed previously. We're saying, okay, you're looking to evaluate a neighborhood given certain stop conditions. So the, the subnet might be fenced by transformers or other switches or stuff like that. So the challenge here is, of course, that you require to have um, quite nice performance um, uh, for these type of graph processing or graph queries. And the challenge is that we are dealing essentially with a spatial graph or a geometric graph because each asset or each cable does essentially have a geometry, so a point 
point or line associated with it. And usually you want to represent the result of your graph query in a spatial manner. So essentially putting it on a map like we see it on the right hand side. One um, other example here is in, in the area of projection where you're looking at a, a bill of material. So which raw material, which components make up your finished goods. Or in a more extended way, you're looking at um, the suppliers, which supply raw material, and the sales side of things, so the customers buying your finished goods. Uh, also here we do see, of course, um, SAP customers um, who have their data in, in, in SRM, Supplier Relationship Management, or ERP systems. So essentially the bill of material and, 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 and the supply information. Of course, if, you, if you're looking at the graph model, you see that, that uh, materials or suppliers or customers are modeled at, as vertices in your graph. But you also see on the right-hand side where you do have a supplier here in red, and then you have a bill of material uh, in orange, and you have a, a final set of customers who buy your finished products, which are in green here. And then there are different types of relationships um, uh, between these vertices. So there is a supply relationship, and in the bomb there is a is used in or is consumed by a type of relationship, and, and finally a, a purchases or, or or buys relationship here. So the key use cases is, is handling supply risk. So what if a certain supplier fails uh, to deliver raw materials? So essentially, how does it affect my production and which customers are affected? So that could be one scenario. But also, for example, calculating actual costs for a certain period of production where you're looking at cost associated for example with logistics so raw materials that need to be moved from one warehouse to another before they can be consumed in the production process so so price calculation cost calculation margin calculation for example what if a raw material is increased uh, in price so to say so it's 10% more expensive. How does it impact the final margin of my finished product? Um, the challenges here is usually that the data is distributed across multiple systems. So customers do not have one ERP system, so they have many. And uh, there are non-SAP systems, which for example, contain the sales information. So you need to collect all the data and create a centralized graph in order to do these type of, of cost calculations. So in essence, what we do see in these use cases is that um, we, we leverage a breadth-first search traversal and propagating values in that statement. So uh, collecting the cost of the raw materials which are made up or used to make up a component which are used to make up a finished product. Essentially pushing measures, aggregating measures, doing calculations while traversing the graph. Um, as another example, um, you as an end customer would like to know from how many suppliers do I actually depend on. So looking into the projection, into the bill of material of your supplier. So all these require essentially very domain specific procedures, which leverage in turn the build in building blocks, which I just showed you. So neighbors and um, breadth first search traversal and the like. As a last example um, here is um, how to calculate cost-based path. And so uh, here's one, one nice use case, which I really like finding, for example, evacuation path in an open terrain. So not on the street network, but out in the fields. So what we're seeing on the right hand side is a, is a digital elevation model of an area in California. So the red areas indicate mountains, so high elevation, and the blue areas indicate low elevation. The black thing, uh, essentially a, a water body. Uh, which uh, for uh, pedestrians is essentially an, a no-go area, at least for most of us. The line that you see here is shortest path uh, from A to B, where you have a more or less complex cost function. So it's not only about horizontal distance, but in this case, it is about finding a path which also minimizes uh, vertical distance, for example, because you don't want to go over the highest mountain. Although from a vertical perspective, it might be the shortest path. Also, you want to avoid the water, uh, water body. So these are essentially a path which you, which you can take.
So in this specific example, the raw material was satellite images or, or spatial indices like a, a elevation model, a digital elevation model. What we used to, to create the, the topology, to create the network, is we use spatial clustering in order to put a grid on top um, our surface. And so you see here the kind of hexagon clustering, which was used by using the spatial engine in HANA. And the edges um, are, of course, edges to the neighborhood. So it's uh, traversals from one grid to another. Besides evacuation path, understand evacuation path, for example, in case of a wildfire, it's, it's also use cases that um, relate to trafficability. So, so in, in the military space, you can ask yourself, so if I need to move a battalion of tanks from A to B, where can I go? So essentially, I can't go through a forest. And I also should avoid muddy areas with high soil moisture, which, which might be represented as cost function. So in this case, the challenges, again, is how to grade your graph. So doing the, uh, the pre-processing. So to how to come from, from raster data, from satellite images to vector data, which can be processed in form of, of then finding shortest path with a, with a complex cost function again, not taking only distance into account, but for example, soil moisture. In uh, the very same use case, you could not only um, ask yourself what is the shortest path or what's the, the cost minimal path, but also um, you could ask yourself what are, what are hmm, kind of isochrones, which areas can be reached uh, with the same cost so to say if you start here so the blue area indicates these are all points that you can read uh, reach um, with the same costs last but not least it's um, finding or identifying uh, evacuation areas for different evacuation points so again think about wildfire and an open terrain you might have rescue points or evacuation points in different in different areas you can ask yourself okay what is the area that belongs to that evacuation point? So essentially, what is the area where the shortest path leads to that specific evacuation point? And in that scenario, using a shortest path one to all function in essence to derive that information. And um, by understanding the evacuation areas, you can of course also do some simulation or planning so where you should build up new evacuation paths with that, I, I hope I gave you an insight into what the channel task of network process is and that you need to deal with how to construct your graph. I gave you some insights, hopefully, in how uh, that thing behaves in SAP HANA. Um, in addition, uh, we talked about some standard examples, how to leverage the built-in function in GraphScript. If you need to find out more, of course, there is the reference guide and there is an open SAP course and there is a developer tutorial out there um, which uh, help you to get more information about SAP HANA Graph. Thanks for your time uh, and bye.